Hey, welcome to 49cc Scoot. My name's Brent, and today it's time for a two-stroke update. I put the Melosi RC1 engine in this scooter one year and a little over 1,500 miles ago, and I've basically only showed you some car and bike shows with it and a little bit of troubleshooting with some tuning issues after the build. That's because, as it turns out, the RC1 is a surprisingly good engine platform, especially considering it's a racing setup. I had one roadside repair at the first car show that I attended when the variator nut came loose. Since then, I've learned to use thread locker somewhat liberally because this setup does not have a conical spring washer or any effective means of keeping the nut in place like the Minarelli clones that I'm so used to. Otherwise, I've mostly had tuning, or maybe you'd call some of them maintenance issues. I struggled for a bit with fouling spark plugs and breaking up at high throttle openings before finally realizing that I had a bad connection with the old spark plug cap and that I needed to replace it. I have had some float issues too. I had to replace the floats once because they were heavier than specified and I just couldn't get the float height correct and another time it decided to overflow at a car show and I couldn't get it to stop. It seems like I have to be right on the edge of overflowing to keep enough fuel in the bowl with this angled carb setup, so I have definitely done my share of float adjustments. Ryan, who you may have seen in car show and other vids riding with me, has a 34mm flat slide on his RC1 and hasn't complained of similar problems at all. So it may be related to the design of the 28mm Del Orto VHST that comes with the RC1. I've also had problems with wear of the mudguard from contact with the rear tire, and it got bad enough that I finally replaced it recently. Do you need replacement parts for your scooter? How about a big bore kit, or a variator, or exhaust? Check out ScooterTuning.ca. They support this channel by giving me discounts that make it possible to try out more parts and share more info with you. Aside from that, they're a great company to deal with, and they get most orders out really fast. I enlarged and elongated mounting holes on the new mudguard to try to make it set a little bit higher. The carburetor also hits the mudguard, leaving behind a small hole from contact with the drain plug. So I wanted to modify that and see if I could keep that up off of the mudguard somehow, thinking that that may also push the mudguard down into the tire less. I started by trying to rotate the intake boot to see if I could make the carburetor sit higher without causing any other problems. I wound up rotating the intake so it angled the carb just slightly toward the CVT and that gave me a small amount more clearance. The more the boot was rotated, the more clearance I could get, but the worse the angle of the carburetor was. I already have enough float height troubles, so I didn't want to change it too much. I took a test ride and found out that the carb was still hitting the mudguard, so I decided to make a support bracket to prevent the carburetor from hitting. The first thing that I wanted to figure out was how to mount a bracket to the carb. There are two holes on one side of the carb that lead to nowhere, which I assume were cast in there for alternate configurations. They have no threads inside, so I installed M6 by 1.0 threaded inserts, called time certs. This worked out well for a couple of reasons. First, the drill size for the inserts was just larger than the holes, so I barely had to remove any material. Second, M6 by 1.0 is the most commonly used fastener size on most of these small scoots, so I have a bunch of different bolts on hand. Once drilled, each hole had a recess cut with a tool from the time cert kit. Then each hole was tapped. If you're thinking, why tap it and then use an insert anyway, I like the common bolt size and the idea of having steel inserts. I used plenty of high strength thread locker and installed the inserts with a tap-like tool that locks them in place. They should stay without the thread locker, but I use it for additional insurance. It looks like I didn't cut the recess deep enough in one hole, so the insert does stick out a little bit, but I already had it locked in when I realized it, and it really wasn't an issue. At this point I could thread bolts into the carb, so I started making a bracket, beginning with a template for a mounting plate.
I marked a piece of quarter inch steel rod where I wanted it to bend so I'd be able to use the mudguard mounting bolt as the support. Then I bent the rod in a vise. Next, I used a technique that I had recently watched a forum member that goes by the name of Rolling Bender use. I heated the end of the rod with an oxygen and map gas torch. Once it was red hot, I hammered it to create a flat spot. It took a few rounds of this, but eventually I had a flat spot to use for mounting. I did some fit checks and cut the end of the rod that needed to attach to the bracket, but left the rod beyond the flattened spot to use as a handle while trying to get the two pieces welded together. I transferred the template that I made onto a piece of 8 inch thick steel flat bar and then cut it out and drilled it. This would be a lot easier for me with a flux core or a MIG welder because those processes can be done one handed leaving your other hand to help you hold a part in place. But that welder needed a new sleeve at the time, so I ended up using the TIG. I finished up by cutting off the end and smoothing it out. Once bolted on, the carburetor could still move, but it would take more force than I think it would ever experience in normal conditions to make it touch the fender. I took the scoot for a test drive and found out that it now wants to act up in a very specific spot around 1 8 to 1 quarter throttle. It would seem like the engine was going to cut out or at least lose power if I tried to hold the throttle there. Upon returning to the garage, I noticed raw fuel on the back wheel and the mudguard both of which were clean before the ride. I assumed that the small change in the angle must be enough to throw off the fuel level in the bowl, causing it to overflow and create a rich condition at low throttle, so I adjusted the float height a little. I took another test ride and the problem was still there, but at least it was no longer spitting fuel. At this point I got paranoid that perhaps one or maybe even both of the passages in the carburetor that I threaded were not actually sealed and I could be causing problems by sealing them off with bolts. It didn't seem that likely, but I wanted to make sure that wasn't the case. I drilled through the center of one bolt so air could pass through. I tried that bolt, which I named a breather bolt, in both holes in the carb, but nothing changed. Then I drilled a second bolt and used one in each hole, and still nothing changed. Okay, so I guess the vibration transmitted to the carburetor through the mount must be causing the problems. Rolling Bender suggested that I simply cut a section out of the bracket and connect the two halves with a rubber hose so the bracket could still provide some support while not being so rigid. I used hose clamps on the quarter inch fuel hose to make sure everything stayed in place. I took another test ride and the problem was gone. So if you ever have a need for a carburetor support, make sure it has some sort of vibration damping. I can see some marks on the underside of the mudguard after a bit of riding, but maybe it will be minor enough not to wear through this time. I'm not sure if it's a known issue yet or another thing that only I seem to experience. Aside from what I've mentioned so far, I've also swapped around some jets and made some adjustments as weather changed but otherwise, I didn't really touch the drivetrain for quite a while. Once I discovered the need for the thread locker on the variator nut, changing the spark plug and cap regularly would have left the carburetor as the only major annoyance, and the carburetor isn't really the toughest thing to switch out if you desire. Speaking of spark plugs, I started using NGK BR10 EG plugs instead of the Denso Iridium IW34 specified by Melosi. There's been no noticeable change in performance, but I have been going longer intervals without needing to change the plugs, and they're cheaper. Ryan Ott tells me that he started using the BR10 EIX, which is the Iridium version, with good results as well. I believe the IW34 would be closer to an 11 series NGK, so the 10 is a little bit hotter than specified, but so far so good for me. 
I'm not sure how this works out if you're racing or using a lot of throttle a lot of the time. So use that info at your own risk because I'm mostly putting around and using the throttle in relatively short bursts. About the worst I do is run up to 70 to 80 miles per hour and then go back to putting around at low throttle. After 775 miles on one belt, I open the CVT cover to go over it and replace the drive belt. The fact that I could go that long without replacing a belt or worrying about it has been amazing to me after breaking or needing to replace belts every 150 to 250 miles on all of my Minarelli clone setups for years now. I'm now confident that something is wrong with the overrange that I've used on other engines for so long, most likely the modified torque driver. Overall everything looked very good and the belt had only worn about 0.4 millimeters from my initial measurement when it was installed. I wouldn't have really needed to replace the belt, maybe just take some shims out if even that, but I wanted to get baseline tests with a fresh belt for some other mods that you'll see in the future. I cleaned the entire CVT and re-greased anything that required lubrication and then stuck it back together. I did a gear oil change while I was at it, and the gear oil came out not looking much different than when I put it in. That probably doesn't sound like a big deal either, but it's nice to see after spending most of my scooter life dealing with Minarelli clones, and draining more than my fair share of dark or grayish gear oil and sometimes even seeing glitter in there. The scooter also had a couple of issues not related to the engine since you've last seen it. First it had a leaky rear tire. It had a slow leak over time and I just couldn't find anything wrong with it with the usual visual inspection or just spraying the wheel and tire with soapy water. I ended up dunking the wheel and tire in a tub of water and then I found a tiny pinhole leak that barely even made any bubbles. I tried plugging it a couple of times, but it never wanted to totally seal, so I just replaced the tire. The brakes also became a problem, mostly the back brake. I could stop, but the back felt very squishy and I couldn't manage to bleed it out enough to make it feel right. The front was okay, but not ideal. So I picked up a pair of Adlin levers to replace the generic levers that I used when I first swapped the RC1 into the scoot. I made a rookie mistake when doing the rear lever install and cost myself a bunch of time trying to get the brake to firm up. I wound up finding out that I had the new adjustable lever in the closest position with the least travel while trying to bleed the brakes. For whatever reason, I looked at the lever and thought it was in the furthest position for the most travel, but it was exactly the opposite. That makes a huge difference in feel and how easy it is to bleed the system. If there's a positive side to my time-consuming mistake, it's probably that I noticed one piston in the dual piston rear caliper didn't look like it moved as freely as the other. I took the pistons out and cleaned and polished them and cleaned the caliper and the existing seals since I didn't have any replacement seals, and that made them move much more freely after. I've been happy since installing the Adeline levers. They make the brakes feel more firm, and overall they are better quality than what I had or honestly any other levers that I've put on a small scooter. Overall, the first 1500 miles with the RC1 have been really good for me. Yes, I did have to do some work to it, but it is a racing engine. There's no shortage of fun to be had with the power that this thing makes, and years ago I would have never dreamed of a small engine this powerful that I was actually able to ride around regularly. Don't get me wrong. This is not what I'd suggest as a commuter, and it's in no way practical, but it has been a whole lot of fun without a whole lot of trouble. That's about it for my 1500 mile RC1 update. Make sure you're subscribed and that you've got notifications turned on, because I've got some mods coming up as well as a couple of events in the near future, and I think they'll be a lot of fun. Don't forget to hit the like button if you've enjoyed the update, and thank you for watching.